I want to start with you with a philosophical question because you're a philosopher. It seems to me that our age is an arm wrestle between two of the great philosophers. Immanuel Kant, who believed that reason sat at the heart of the Enlightenment, the ability to use your reason. And David Hume, who believed that reason was a slave to passion. Is David Hume the philosopher winning that arm wrestle today? David Hume, I'm a great admirer of, and he's, he, 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 don't think he is winning the arm wrestle because I think the point is he's misunderstood, right? So I don't, I don't think that's right, but that's the way it's been taken. Um, Hume's point was, uh, Hume is often misunderstood, he was misunderstood in his day on this. People accused him of saying that if you, if you took him seriously, you know, anything goes and that you can believe anything's the cause of anything, etc., mm. etc. Et and he, he, you know, he gave answers in his lifetime to these objections. Hume's point was rather, when it comes to the, about reason being the slave of the passions, is that when it comes to motivation, what we really want to do, that's not something reason, reason can't give you motivations. Think about what do you really want from life. If you say what I want is, you know, happiness, love, friendship, peace, etc. I mean, you can't actually say, you know, reason, there's no rational argument why it should be a peaceful world rather than an unpeaceful world. It's based in feeling. So his point was that the root of ethics is feeling, but it's not just you know, knee-jerk feeling. The reason has an extremely important role in interrogating what our emotions are telling, asking us whether it would indeed be wise to follow certain feelings rather than others, because we have many different feelings, of mm. course, right? And sometimes conflicting And sometimes feelings. conflicting. So reason's got a really important role to play. But what, what Hume was doing was, he was sort of attacking, I mean, Kant came after him. Hume was really attacking people like Descartes and Plato, mm -hmm. who believed that reason alone was the master. And, and so, like I said at the end there, I think the point is, we, it's always kind of wrong to separate out reason and to say we should worship reason and forget about everything else. Reason, emotion, character, these, these things which are important for rhetoric are also important for you know, the good life, creating the good life, putting those three things together. You also make the point in your book about reason where I think you use John Stuart Mill as an example where your reason will lead you to your conclusion. You also make the point that you don't want to be a slave to your own reason in that sense, that you need to question reason. What well, well you do, because the point is, I think, because you've always got to... It's, 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 when it comes to anything significant about how we ought to live, I don't think reason all, ever always does the work by itself. Behind it is always some, some judgment. This is, I think, the dirty, the dirty secret of philosophy. That philosophy it's, a, it's as much about the philosopher <laughs> and his, uh, his views or her views yeah. as it is about the idea, isn't well, it? Well, it, it, what you take fundamentally to be a reason for action in, motivationally isn't something which can ultimately be sort of rationally proven or demonstrated. It's not like saying two and two equals four, right? So you have to give other kinds of reason. You have to, uh, and, and those kind of reasons are appealing to people's perhaps you know, humanity. Also, human nature. Hume was a person who thought philosophy had to be rooted in human nature, mm. right? So when we're talking about what makes the ideal society, we're not talking about what would make the ideal society for any kind of intelligent creature, whether Martian. Who knows? I mean, for example, then if human beings were wired differently, then you know, maybe you know, monogamy would be a completely stupid idea rather than something which a lot of people find you know, fruitful and, and beneficial. So you, you have to start with human nature. And human nature is something which is given by nature. It's not given by reason. That's the key point. But where human nature conflicts with, with reason, in a sense, if, if we can put it that way, I mean, I'm just, if, if you look at the world today, the, the conceit of liberalism uh, and growing out of the Enlightenment, the ideas of universalism, is that those ideas and that morality and that eth those ethics can be applied everywhere. Mm. We know that that came with imperialism and, and colonialism. Is it, is it, in a sense, the, the sort of liberal idea that universalism counter to, the, to, to human nature? Are humans more hardwired for tribalism than we are for universalism? Oh, well, well, that's quite interesting, but I think that here you've got to be a bit careful because I, I use the term human nature, perhaps mm. a little bit loosely. You can talk about human nature, but to, to what it, human nature is not rigidly fixed, right? Mm. So it's so, informed by yeah, culture a, and history. Exactly. And so there are certain forms of life which would never be possible for human beings as we know them biologically, but within that, there's a plurality of different ways of life. 
Now, that's why I think the, the universalism was perhaps misguided. It's not because, generally speaking, when you're um, trying to be reasonable and argue rationally with people, you're always trying to kind of reach the point of view which is as universal as possible, if you like. You're trying to reach maximum agreement. But recognising that, that there's, there are limits to that is extremely important. And particularly when you're talking about how we ought to live, right, and what makes for the right society, again, accepting the fact that being rational and reasonable and trying to come to that consensus isn't necessarily going to give you exactly the same solution in all times and places. I mean, I think most obviously, for example, you know, we live in a world which has got you know, billions and billions of people on it in which we can travel around and in which our effects on the environment are huge. So it wouldn't be surprising if what was right for our kind mm. of society was not exactly the same as what was right when we had little city-states and like human beings were like dots on the planet. Tom, I'll just bring you in on this now because that really goes to the, the dilemma of our age. Uh, we are seeing a resurgence of tribalism, sectarianism, nationalism mm. in what was meant to be the era of the end of history, to go back to Francis Fukuyama's quote of mm. 1989, that this idea that liberal democracy, in liberal democracy we'd reached humanity's zenith. This was the great ideological battle now mm. resolved. And liberal democracy was going to flower everywhere. And for a while, he was right. But why are we now seeing the resurgence of this division and a return to nationalism, protectionism, hard borders? Why are we seeing that in our world now? Well, you're right, Stan. I mean, and one of uh, Fukuyama's heroes, of course, was Immanuel Kant. And, yes. and, and Hegel. And Hegel. Well. And so perpetual peace, the idea that... Uh, with the collapse of communism and the end of the Cold War, we reached the end point of humankind's ideological mm. evolution, universalisation of Western liberal democracy. And, and as you say, for a while there in the 90s, and indeed in the early to mid-2000s, history did seem to be moving in that progressive liberal direction. Well, we, we went from 30-odd democracies in the early 70s right. to more than 110, 120 by the 2000s. And so it, it was on the ascendant. That's right, but since 2005, they've been coming down. Uh, now, you could argue that some states like Hungary are still democracies, but it's hard to say that when their leader, Orban, unashamedly applies the adjective illiberal democracy. Uh, but anyway, uh, look, the reasons are complex. I think in many respects the Liberals and indeed neoconservatives throughout the 90s and 2000s, 2000s had a naive view that liberalism would somehow transform the world. Um, some nation states are uh, behind uh, the, in development. Uh, Iraq is a classic case in point. The invasion of Iraq was seen as a, a liberal mission to well, export spread, democracy. Spreading freedom, as, as George Bush said. And exporting democracy is not a... Com ex 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 promoting democracy is not an export commodity. It's a do-it-yourself enterprise, and it requires very special circumstances and conditions, especially when you're dealing with countries that are ethnically and tribally divided, and there's sectarianism there. So it's a, it's a very difficult process. Add into that the rise of powers like China the resurgence of Russian power. But I think, getting back to Trump, it's not just the question of nationalism, it's, it's the role that digital technology has played here in further inflaming public opinion. Hold, hold that thought, because I, I do want to come back to that, and Jody has something specific uh, to go to on this. But Jody, just another 30,000 foot question before we get down into, into some detail. I've often wondered that part of this blowback against democracy and, and a rise of authoritarianism and illiberalism is that democracy is no longer fit for purpose, yeah. that democracy was never designed for an age of globalisation. Democracy had worked much better in very narrowly confined states, largely homogenous states, but states that are incredibly pluralistic and incredibly diverse, where everybody is competing for their rights and the right to be heard and making increasing demands of the state means you're going to have greater levels of dissatisfaction. Do you see in part of the blowback that we're witnessing now, take Europe as an example, the, the challenges to the European idea and the, the European experiment, that democracy itself may no longer be fit for purpose. I'm slightly worried by the argument that says democracy is no longer fit for purpose because I th see the corollary of that is people starting to say, well, you know, look at Singapore. It's lovely. Everybody's so happy. It's clean. But it's the streets small are clean. And very easily you know, and we should, you know, we should all be emulating that. And, and for, for somebody who believes in individual liberty and our ability to express ourselves and our own opinions and beliefs, that's extremely disturbing. Look, I think 
we have to give democracy a chance. As we understand it in the modern sense, it's incredibly new. If yeah. you think about it, we heard Marilyn uh, earlier talking about New Zealand as, as being the first country that gave women the vote. That's little over 100 years ago. In the, in the time span of the development of voting systems, representative democracy, that's incredibly small. And I think what has happened is um, there was this great flourish, in particular post-1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall, where we all got incredibly excited that um, traditional democracy as we know it was going to sort of spread like wildfire throughout the world and everybody would have it and everybody would have their voice heard and, and prosperity would suddenly flourish and, and that didn't happen for a number of reasons including if you look at for example South Africa where despite um, having f equal franchise people were not economically better off. And so people start to challenge the system itself mm. rather than saying, actually, what is the problem with, for example, the capitalist model rather than democracy that is not delivering benefits to us. So I think what's happened is people see that their lot is not improving. Uh, I think that's certainly true in Europe, that the rich are getting richer, but the, but the poor are staying the same or getting poorer. And rather than examining some of the other systems that might be uh, enabling that, they look to de the democratic system in itself and say that's the problem. And I think that's mm. where we're making the mistake. It, it, yeah, Julian, it's really fascinating too, of course, because what we are seeing in Brexit, what we are seeing in Hungary with the results mm. of you know, Viktor Orban entrenching his power, what we are seeing in an increasing vote for uh, alternative for Germany, AFD, what we are seeing in Marine Le Pen's increased vote, uh, Gert Wilders as well in, in, in the Netherlands, and Donald Trump is in fact democracy in action, yeah. isn't it? These people are voting for people who are putting themselves up for election and saying, here's what I believe, Donald Trump certainly did not hide what he believed. Marine Le Pen is very open about what she mm. believes, and people vote for them. That's democracy, isn't it? Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, I think, you know, illiberal democracy is not an oxymoron, right? Mm. I mean, no, you know, not. I think that's the problem. And I think that in order to, I agree, we, we don't, the, the danger is if we're not prepared to look at the weaknesses and failings of democracy how it's, as it's developed, then people who are disillusioned in democratic countries are going to look to authoritarian. Um, alternatives. I think we need to look at what's gone wrong. And I think the point is, is, is quite straightforward in a way. It's that there are all these economic factors which have brought it to the surface. But there's a more fundamental, almost philosophical point here, which is there's been this slide, like I said in the talk, where we think democracy is about exercising the will of the people. There is no such thing. We had a referendum in the UK on Remain. The will of the people, 52-48. That means 52% on that day thought that on balance, of the people who voted, on balance thought that this was probably the best thing with even various if, degrees even of Even if conviction. the next day they wondered yeah, what yeah. they voted and for. And well, actually, not many, have, and fewer <laughs> have changed their minds than you might think. But, you know, the will of the people, nonsense. The people are divided. Yeah. So I think we have to sort of like have it really open. Democracy is not about exercising the will of the people. Democracy is about, as we're exercising, the sort of negotiation of the people together for their common interests. And, right? and, and to that extent, Julian, this idea, and you mentioned it before, everyone would like a less fractious society. Everyone would like a more harmonious society. We throw the word tolerance around a lot. But do we really need a less fractious and more harmonious society? society. You know, the idea of the third way that we saw during the 90s, the Blairs yeah. and the Clintons and the Schroders and the Chiracs, in, in a sense, could have laid the foundation for what we're seeing today, because it, it led to a hollowing out of debate, a neutralising of many areas of discussion uh, that could have actually sowed the seeds for what we're seeing today. Well, yeah, sure. I think there's something in that. I mean, harmony is an interesting term because it's an important thing in Confucian philosophy. It's, it's a term which is abused, it's misused by the current Chinese government, but in its true sense, harmony is a value of society together in which difference is the essential factor. So in Confucian harmony, the analogies are things like a soup. A nice soup is not made by everyone, all the ingredients being the same, right? It's different ingredients blending together for the whole. So harmony requires difference. So in that sense, when we talk about a more harmonious society, we don't mean one in which everyone agrees because that's impossible. What we mean is one where people who have different viewpoints can discuss their disagreement in, t t civilly. And it's the, the lack, what's the problem has been that the disagreement is not being handled at all well in a lot of our societies. It's, it's become fractious. Disagreement doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be fractious, mm. right? Mm. And, and, I think, and I think to build on that, you know, we talk a lot about 
we've lost the ability um, to disagree. Actually, what I think we've lost the ability to do in many cases is agree, um, or, f or at least find um, agreement should, should about we what to? we disagree about. Should, so, oh, so, so, should, should we so, have to agree, though? That no, should, should we that don't be the have aim? to agree. But what we do have to do, I think, is be able to recognise that we disagree with, with one another and that we find a way forward. Mm. You know, I think compromise has become a really dirty word in politics. You turn a dirty word. What is wrong occasionally with saying, you know what, this is a stupid idea. I made a mistake. <laughs> uh, you know, oh, uh, you'd be uh, a flip-flopper. Exactly. So yeah. but, in, but in modern parlance, yeah. that has become to, 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 have, to admit that you have made a mistake, changed your mind, God forbid, mm. is a dirty word. And I think we have got to to accept because it's seen as weakness and and I think we have got to accept that actually you only move forward you only get to this position of harmony by identifying where you disagree and then how to move on and I I talked about this uh, earlier this week with when we were talking to a number of students if you think about how you end wars you don't do it by making peace with all of your friends. You, may, you find that you do it by making peace with your enemies, which at some point means that you have to accept that you both disagree about something and you, move, you find a way to move forward. Tom, let's bring it to a, a hard example. Uh, the idea that we need to find some consensus out of disagreement or harmonise disagreement, we'll be able to live with disagreement. We had the, uh, the, the uh, marriage equality vote in Australia last year, uh, this year. A year ago, a year, year ago, yeah, November. Uh, this year's gone so quickly, <laughs> I've just completely lost But let, let, let me put it this way, if, if someone voted against that, yeah. based on a, a firm uh, and enduring religious principle, mm. why should that person have to accept the result of that, now they may have to live with it, mm. but why should they have to be open to finding harmony with that decision, accepting that decision, if that is an affront to their belief and their faith? Well, you're right. I think there are certain subjects that can't be discussed openly without inspiring immediate hysteria. And unfortunately, at various stages last year, that same-sex marriage issue was one of them. And I think on no issue, no public policy issue in the modern era has an issue change the public opinion so rapidly. So if you go 10, 15 years ago, the overwhelming consensus in the United States, in Britain, in, in Canada, New Zealand, virtually all liberal democracies, was uh, traditional marriage, opposition to same-sex marriage. But then during the course of the next 10 or so years, the public opinion changed dramatically. And, and the marriage equality movement, in my judgment, made great strides in promoting love and respect and tolerance and they won middle Australia. It was an overwhelmingly convincing Which is victory. how it's meant to work. It was 60% of the vote in the postal vote. And I think it was something similar like that in many other countries, including in Ireland, which is an overwhelmingly Catholic country. However, there's a paradox here. On the one hand, not all, obviously, but there were certain activists in the marriage equality movement who obviously preached love and tolerance. But at the same time, they were not very tolerant of those who held a different view. And I thought that was a real problem last year. And, and Julian, this, is, this goes to the heart of the dilemma that you had identified. Um, we don't necessarily just disagree with someone now. We don't say your view is mm. wrong. We say that you are wrong. Worse than that, we pathologise it. There is something intrinsically wrong with you. You are a bad human being if you don't agree with me. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's right. People find it very hard to accept how people who have very different views are, are just not, you know, wicked and evil. I mean, so, you know, the, the, the Hillary Clinton line, wasn't it, about uh, coming with the word d d deplorables, you know. Um, yeah, that, that, Basket that, of deplorables. That could have, and the John Major's basket, yeah. So we, ha we have that kind of thing. It's very hard, but, you know, this is where... This is where the empathy thing is important, right? You have to try and get inside someone's mind, but then you have to sort of try and work with them. The thing about the, the, the issue you just um, mentioned is that I think part of the problem there is, again, it's this like zero-sum game idea of democracy, mm. that the point is the vote's been had, and now it's over. So you just shut up and get on with it, right? Now, actually, the vote's been had, the law's been passed, I'm very pleased it has. Now, we should accept the fact that it doesn't mean that everyone who lost now can has to, we have to pretend they're going to agree with everyone. They're not. 
in a, in a democratic society, they have an obligation now to go along with it and abide by the law, but asking them to be happy about it isn't reasonable, and asking them even not to campaign, to have it back is unreasonable as well, you know? I mean, if, if, they, still dis if they still think it's wrong, you know, the ability to change your mind is important, right? So if we shouldn't be trying to shut people down. So we've had the debate, now shut up. That's the problem. But at the same time, it's difficult to do that because we found it so hard for that debate to continue without it being fractious. We want them to shut up because we, don't want, we want the debate to go away because it's too nasty. I, I said briefly on, on, on what Jody was saying there, I thought that you could sum up your point here, which is that these days we value too much people have the courage of their convictions, whereas the, the real courage is to be able to challenge your own convictions, right? Well, it's an interesting thing, Jody, when people say you have the courage of your convictions. I'm sure Hitler, Hitler had the courage of his yeah. convictions. Uh, I've met members of Al-Qaeda, ISIS mm. and the Taliban who have absolutely the courage of their convictions. <laughs> uh, yeah, blind belief, faith is not necessarily... Unquestioned a, belief is a bad thing. Yeah, blind faith can be an incredibly dangerous thing. I, look, I, I think to pick up on the point about the, the gay marriage issue, I think it's really interesting the way in which we can advocate for a more tolerant uh, civil society, um, often in ways that are inc incredibly intolerant and, and uncivil. And, and I think you very rarely get to a position where you effectively change people's minds, either by telling them to shut up, mm. not very effective mechanism for convincing people that they might want to change their minds, um, or by denigrating uh, and dismissing their beliefs out of hand, also not a great um, uh, uh, convincer. And I think this is where we've got to get better at um, learning how to debate with people and discuss with people who disagree with us, rather than simply sort of hurling verbal rocks at them and telling them, as you said, not just your beliefs are wrong, but you are wrong and there's something wrong with you, <laughs> but actually to take a step back and say, okay, you know, I believe this, I strongly believe this, and, and let me explain to you why the, the things that you are saying about gay marriage or homosexuality I find deeply troubling and offensive. And sometimes that can be difficult because the person on the other side is saying things to you that you find deeply offensive, mm. hurtful, hateful even. J Jody, you know, it, the ability in a democracy to vote for something and accept the result comes down to your faith in that system. That despite having, you know, we will have a federal election sometime in the next six months, half of us in the room will not get the government that we voted for. We won't tear the country apart because we accept that the instruments of democracy, the soft guardrails of democracy, are strong enough to be able to contain our differences. Is one of the problems now that those soft guardrails of democracy, the erosion of faith in the judiciary, the erosion of faith in the quality of leadership and politicians, uh, is now weakening our strength, our, our faith in the very system itself. So those differences become more fractious and exacerbated because we no longer have a faith in the system that would have meant that we can live with those differences. I think there's a couple of things. I think one is a lack of faith in the system itself. So people feel that despite voting, it's not delivering the things for which you voted. So I think that's the first thing. And I think the second thing is a sense of disconnection more generally, that the system at the top doesn't seem to impact on people's lives in, uh, on a daily basis. And therefore, your ability to affect change as it, as it is most pertinent to you doesn't come through exercising your vote at the ballot box anymore. That, that, that's not going to have the difference in your daily life that you might want it to. And therefore, I think, uh, as we've heard uh, from various speakers uh, over the last couple of days, I think that's why you're seeing this resurgence of more popular movements, because they see that as a more effective way to bring about change. Me Too movements, women's marches, and so on, even, even populist marches. They see that as a more effective way to bring about change than through the ballot box. Uh, um, Tom, Donald Trump, and, and I want to deal with the, the Trump phenomenon um, by a reflection on Barack Obama. Uh, we heard Julian talk about Obama as being very, you know, the embodiment of, of that idea of ethos and pathos and logos. But this was the same man who very early on in his presidency, you know, looked down at the sort of white mm. American working class and said, oh, you know, when they're under pressure, they cling to their God and their guns. Mm. A precursor to the basket of deplorables mm -hmm, comment mm -hmm. from, from, from uh, Hillary Clinton. In a sense, were people right to look at the the Washington elite that Obama represented, the sort of liberal progressives, and say that they are disdainful of us. They don't have us yeah, in I mind. I think that liberal condescension to which you refer was a contributing factor to the Trump phenomenon. 
There's no question. And indeed, if you go to some of those battleground states that determined the election in 2016, um, Ohio, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, uh, these are old um, manufacturing states, um, the Rust Belt, so-called Rust Belt. Uh, a lot of the white working class folks in those electorates actually supported Obama in 2008 and 2012, but they switched and voted for Trump. And one of the reasons why they were attracted to Obama and the Democrats is because they were railing against neoliberalism and free market capitalism and globalisation. Uh, and this was especially evident in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. But those folks were not just angry with globalisation, they were angry with the Washington elite mm. uh, and they felt they were condescended to, for lack of a better word. Um, and, you know, Julian made the point in his remarks about these ghastly acts that have been taking place in the course of the last 24 to 48 hours of these pipe bombs or so-called pipe bombs that have been sent to people like President Obama, former President Obama, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden overnight and some Hollywood actors and even CNN. And it's despicable and it's terrible and it should be condemned. But this is all in the context of this heightened polarisation. So when you have President Trump's press secretary going to a restaurant and being refused service because the owner didn't like her politics, You've had many cases where uh, left-wing activists would go into restaurants and target Republican lawmakers, kicking them out of the restaurants. Mm -hmm. You've had many of these left-wing activists going to the homes of cabinet secretaries and yelling abuse at, abuse at them, um, making sure that they don't get any sleep. Um, we had a left-wing activist going out of his way to try to assassinate Republican lawmakers. I'm not trying to say that the left are bad here. This is all in the confines of Trump. And he's made a bad situation worse, but I would argue he's a symptom, not the cause of this problem. And I think, and I, think I just wanted to pick up on something that, that you chatted about with Julian, which is this question of, of universal. Is a, can we identify some kind of universal human values? I think if you think about one of the things that we all, I think, want is to be, to matter, to feel that we, we matter to someone. And I think you're right that it, whether you are on the left or the right, no one wants to hear that they don't matter, you know, or be, be demeaned or belittled. And, and so, therefore, to hear a president of whatever kind standing up and, and event, essentially espousing um, an opinion that sounds like, well, you guys don't matter, you know, you uh, working class white people, you don't matter, or you the black community, or you the Hispanic community, you don't matter, that is hugely disenfranchising. And I think one of the reasons I think we are seeing this rise in populist further is because there's, there's a real drive for people to feel that they matter. Do you, do you, can you overlay, Jody, some of the things that Tom identified in the United States with the Brexit vote as well? I mean, I, David Goodhart, the British political writer, has identified two groups of people that he calls the somewheres and the anywheres. The anywheres are the, well, they're us, really, the people who are at home in many different places, educated, travelled, um, cosmopolitan, and then people who are somewheres, who still work and live, you know, within a sort of 50 kilometre radius of where they were born and they, they, they have their local sports team and they attend their local church, or, you know, the people where the somewhere does matter. Can you overlay a lot of those issues that Tom identified in the, the, the sort of, the, the division, political division in the United States and that blowback against the Liberal elite with the Brexit vote? I think it's more complicated than that. I think Brexit isn't quite so much a question in its entirety about... Um, liberal elites versus the other. I think there's a, a number of, of overlaying factors. Um, one is about, I think, simply a nervousness about an unelected group of people sitting in, in Brussels having sway, or Strasbourg, having sway over uh, what we do in the UK and a nervousness about this. And, but what I do think is really important about both Brexit, but I think... Um, the, the kind of populist drive more generally is that it is in mu much part driven by emotion. I think this, this comes back to Julian's point. A lot of it is not rational. I voted to remain. And when I analysed it, there was no... I didn't sit down and do the maths and think rationally mm. And, mm. and, you know, work out how I would benefit economically. It was an entirely em emotional reaction. I consider myself to be European, strongly European. So... Why, therefore, should I look down on someone who made a, an exactly 
exactly the same decision, but for the other, <laughs> for the other direction. Why, why should I dismiss that? Now, if you believed that you were going to get 350 billion pounds, or whatever, whatever it was, 350 million pounds back for the NHS, that's a different thing. But we shouldn't sort of sneer at people who made emotional decisions mm. to vote for Brexit, for example, because I think most people who voted for Remain did exactly mm. the same thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the other, I, think that's, I think that's right. I think part of this is that, you know, if, you're not, if, the, if the door of reason isn't open to you, then what option have you got but to go with your gut? And I think it what has been closed off by a lot of people. They weren't being listened to. I think that's true. Uh, a lot of, you know, ordinary working people, as we call them. The way in which they were being talked to was sort of patronising, you know, is all the professionalisation of political communications essentially meant that people weren't trying to have a debate with the electorate, a discussion, they were basically just trying to sort of persuade them one way or another. And I think, you know, I think so if you do that, and also the thing is that if, if they do sit down and, and look rationally and reasonably, and people do, they have good rational arguments for seeing that the system isn't working for them. So um, there's a guy called William Davis who's written a book called Nervous States, which is a very good book about how you know, emotion has become more important. And, and he, he sort of like tries to shift the blame a bit back onto the experts. We're saying the so-called experts have indeed got a lot of things wrong. They haven't been actually analysing what matters. So let's talk about you know, years and years of growth in GDP. So ec economics says the world's getting better and you know, unemployment is rising. And, you know, so why aren't they happy? Well, you look at the statistics in a different way and you see that in all sorts of developed countries, the bottom 50% haven't seen any growth at all in their standard of living for, for decades. All the growth is going towards the top. So you know, if, you're being, if you're in that bottom 50% and you're being rational and you conclude the system isn't working for you, yeah, you're being rational. That's not being emotional. And if then you sort of respond to that, the only means you can by an emotional kick against the establishment, because I think, I think that's probably a bit more important than Jody does in, in the Brexit thing, then who can blame them? You've got to, if there's no channel for them to sort of like, you know, get their point of view and be listened to in a more rational way, of course you, you, you kick the cat, you know. Yeah, on Jody and, and Brexit, just quickly, I mean, I think what also distinguished Brexit from Trump is that on Brexit, the broad cross-section of politicians in Westminster, Lib Dems, Labor and Tories, majority, clear majority of them supported Lee, uh, Remain, mm. but seven out of ten Labor Party constituencies, particularly in the northern part of England, were strong leavers. Mm. And, of course, the Tory grassroots, the Tory shires, were strong Brexiteers as well. And that just re-emphasises your point, Stan, about the somewheres and anywheres. The base of these these political movements were clearly uh, somewheres, whereas the political elite were the anywheres. Yeah. But, but even if, I mean, the, the, the real number of the problem, though, here is that even if the, the kickback was, was against the political establishment, they are not the people that suffer. The people that suffer uh, were the immigrants, people oh, of colour yeah. and so on, this who get blamed for yeah. that system. And that, that, that raised another issue that I wanted to go to specifically, and that is the question of immigration. If there is one thing that is driving politics around the world today, it is the question of immigration. Donald Trump campaigned on it. You know, we have our own issues here and border protection and refugee policy here. Right across Europe, they're dealing with it. Angela Merkel has had to deal with the blowback against her decision to allow refugees into the country. Uh, it's behind Viktor Orban's success in Hungary. And, and Julian, it tests this idea of tolerance, doesn't it? The idea that, that liberalism can mean endless plurality. It can mean end, endless relativism. That we can just continue to, to build societies and bring people into societies that may not necessarily fit and may challenge the idea of what a nation is. But immigration is one of those issues, isn't it, where to wade into those waters is incredibly perilous because if you talk about it, you can be branded a racist or a bigot. Well, I think that has been a problem. I think that problem hasn't been the case for a while. When David Goodhart started writing about these issues, uh, I think yeah. that was true. I think that now, you know, it's understood that you can talk about them seriously without necessarily being racist or, or bigot. Yeah, I mean, there are, so many, there are so many things here which are uh, so many things to discuss. I mean, one is that actually, if you look at the reaction of a lot of people who are anti-immigration, you know, if you actually get up close rather than poll and everything, you find that, you know, very few people are actually hardline racist. They but they genuinely feel 
that the character of their, their neighborhoods is changing and that it's more difficult for them to get work because of it. Now, some of those things are truer than others, but it's not complete nonsense. And again, if you look at simply the fact that the globalized world with greater movement of labor has disproportionately benefited the, the, the well-off, and it hasn't benefited. So they, they may be wrong to think their jobs are being stolen by immigrants. Most of the data says that's not true. But it's certainly, they're not wrong to say that immigration isn't helping their prospects very well. That seems to be the case. Um, but the second thing is about this, you know, that the plurality and openness and diversity of society, all these values that we're supposed to say are great and wonderful. Yeah, I think perhaps, you know, it hasn't been appreciated the fact that you, you need the common ground in order for people to sort of like do different things in parts of it, if you see, see my metaphor. And I think, the, the, I think unfortunately, for all well-intentioned reasons, people were too shy of that. In the name of respect for different cultures, people weren't basically ensuring mm. that when people came into the country that you know, they were given the opportunity to um, you know, integrate as best they can. And again, I don't like that word too much, integration, because actually it doesn't really matter how much you integrate as long as you are following the, 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 ground, the gen, uh, general ground rules. I always find it quite interesting, for example, that no one ever complained about... I've never heard anyone complain about Chinese in, in Britain. Now, there are Chinatowns, right? Mm. So there, there are like areas which are like... Chinese live there, it's Chinese food, they, they speak Chinese, and people never got upset and said, the problem with these Chinese is they don't integrate. Why is that? Because there was never perceived to be a problem, because in terms of, you know, I don't know, rule of law, sending their kids to the schools, etc., etc., there was enough integration. So I think, I think it's, it's not about saying, you come to our country, you must become like us, which is nonsense because us are very different and diverse anyway. But it is saying, come to our country, here are some basics, please follow these, and then you can do but what it, you want. It's, it's more than that, isn't it, Jody? Because you mentioned before the feeling, the emotional response people had to the Brexit decision. Is it wrong, or is it wrong for someone to express a view that, uh, you know, and you hear this a lot, I, I've lost my place in my country. My country has changed and I didn't ask for this. You know, uh, that there are people here that I'm not sure of. Now, we know that those things work themselves out over time. They do in a, in a well-functioning pluralist democracy. But the ability to say that, the ability to say that, uh, you know, as Julian says, there are common values in a society that holds that society together. It's perilous ground to have that sort of conversation now, isn't it? I think, look... Um, I think, obviously, uh, you know, it's extremely important that people should be able to express their opinion. And I think one of the things that has been a challenge in recent times is that people have not felt able to do that and therefore have looked to the more extremist elements who, who have the... They see the courage and the boldness. It's what they like about Trump. It's what they like about Auburn. It's what they like about... Tommy Robinson in the UK. They've looked to those people who they think have the bravado and the courage to say the things that they feel and not allowed to say. And authenticity, they think, that they speak mm. to something that they that, Yeah, that although I think that's, you know, I think that's nonsense. I think all of that, that, you know, I think for all of those I've mentioned, it's performative. They know mm. very well that if they go as extreme as possible, it's going to get them lots of attention, it's going to get them lots of column inches and therefore lots of followers. Um, so I think it's really important that people should be able to express their opinions. But just because you have a right to speak doesn't necessarily mean that what you say is no, right. No. And I think, again, we also have to be able to challenge that. It's important that we push back to people and say, you know, we challenge the assumption that immigrants come in and take everybody's jobs. You know, in, in the places that voted most strongly in Brexit um, and said that immigration was a, a challenge had the lowest levels of immigration. So it, in, in reality, when you take emotion against fact, it wasn't actually that people were taking their jobs, it was fear. And I think there's a, a layer that we need to put over this. In times when those in power recognise that the populace is, is um, discontent, it's always easiest to blame the weakest in society. And I think that's what we're seeing is happening. We are seeing increasingly leaders pointing the finger at the weakest in society, often the immigrants, 
um, because it means that they don't have to look at themselves. No, no politician, politicians very rarely say it's actually our fault. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we shouldn't, you don't vote for us. Because we're, <laughs> we're, you know, the reason you're all unhappy is because of us. They say, it's because of you. It's yeah. because of that person over there who came to our country last week. It's because of all the Mexicans. If we just got rid of the Mexicans, everything would be better. And I really think we need to be careful about that narrative because it is certainly becoming, I think, seen to be increasingly acceptable that leaders use that language. Well, well, let me put this in an Australian context. I think there's no question that immigration has been a very good thing for this country, both culturally and economically. Um, but uh, there's only going to be democratic support, popular support, for large-scale non-discriminatory immigration if the people think their leaders have the system under control. And I think there was a broad cross-section of Brits who believe that their leaders in Westminster was letting unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats in Brussels determine their immigration policy. And I go back to a famous statement made by John Howard. He was our Prime Minister, a Conservative Prime Minister from 96 to 2007. And at the height of an asylum seeker standoff in August, September 2001, he found, and this was on the eve of an election that he was supposed to lose, according to the polls, he said, we will determine who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come. Now that struck a raw nerve with a lot of ordinary Australians, including a lot of Labor Party people, so much so that the Labor Party gave strong support to the tough border protection policies that his government put in place. But here's the rub. Those tough border protection policies that Howard put in place in 01 and 02, for the next five years of his government, the legal non-discriminatory immigration intake more than doubled. Mm. So that demonstrates that by having control, you can and boost having, public confidence. And having the comp um, we In about five minutes, I'll be taking questions from the floor. If people, there are two microphones here, if people could make their way there in advance and I can get through as many as I can. In the five minutes left, the, the question of, of Twitter and social media that you raised. Jody, um, you're involved in a Twitter storm right oh, now, yes, which goes specifically to this issue of who can speak and who can't and what the consequences are for so-called free speech. Just quickly tell us about your situation. So, in, in, in brief, um, we were due next week to uh, be the media support partner for an event called Truth to Power Cafe, which is a brilliant idea. It was um, going to be in a venue that much similar to this, where a group of very different people were going to have five minutes each to talk about who they would like to speak their truth to and why. A whole wide variety of people. One of the speakers invited uh, was a woman called Julie Bindle, who is a, a well-known radical feminist in the UK. Um, two other participants complained to the organiser that uh, Julie Bindle was transphobic, that she was guilty of hate speech, and asked for her to be disinvited, otherwise they wouldn't come. So the organiser disinvited Julie Bindle. At which point, we as a freedom of expression organisation said, we can no longer, I'm afraid, support this event because our belief is that everybody has the right to speak. Cue an enormous Twitter storm that's sort of going on, in a sense, above my head, which was, we put out a very simple statement saying we can't support this, um, which unleashed amongst people who I think, uh, who, who claim to want to be treated with civility and respect, the most uncivil um, and least respectful dialogue that I have seen. So people swearing at each other on Twitter, people um, using slurs, uh, and very little discussion about um, how we might be able to have some kind of reasoned and reasonable discussion about trans issues in the UK, which are particularly um, uh, in the public eye at the moment because we're um, in consultation for something called the Gender Recognition Act, which would allow people to self-identify as men or women without having to go through any kind of medical assessment. It came from a, a, what I consider to be a good place, which is that those people who um, uh, were wanting to um, go through a transgender process, the, the pro procedure was very complicated and difficult and quite traumatic, and so this act was supposed to deal with it. But it's raised all sorts of questions about identity, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a man. It's unleashed all sorts of accusations Quest of uh, hate speech. Questions we should be able to ask and deal with in a rational questions way. Questions we should be able to ask and debate without being accused so of being 
homophobic, of hate speech. So ex ex explain this, Julian. Um, we seem to love free speech if it's free speech that we like. If we don't like it, <laughs> how, how, how do you explain this in the context of what you were talking about before, this ability of, of, of having a, a harmonious or, or, or a less fractious society? Well, I mean, I think it's because, in a sense, we don't value free speech in the right way, which is why we need people like Index. What we, we've, what we increasingly value is the right to our opinion. And we don't appreciate the fact that the right to your opinion entails the right to someone else's opinion, and for someone to be able to say your opinion is terrible. I find that you criticise. People don't like to be criticised. You, you say, I don't agree with you, and I was offended. I've got, I've got a right to my opinion. I say, yeah, I know. I'm saying I don't agree with you, and I'm <laughs> criticising it. I'm not saying I have, a, I have a right to be an arsehole as well if I want to be. That doesn't mean I doesn't mean I should be one, right? So you know, and I, but I think it's important though because I think that the right to free speech is a very important one. But what is not sufficiently recognised is that just because you have a right to do something, it doesn't mean you should always exercise that right. You, we should actually have so self -restraint. discretion matters. Self restraint is what's missing in this. I think that the way in which we think about our rights these days are very much like these like consumer rights. That, that it's all about my right to exercise them. And we don't think enough about how actually we have to be careful and use discretion in exercising them because a civil society demands a certain amount of like sensitivity to how others might feel. Thank you, please, to our panel here today. A great example, a great example of, have a, of how to have a difficult discussion about difficult issues with different opinions and no one was at each other's throats. So, and thank you so much for coming along.